Good afternoon to everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce to everyone our speaker for this afternoon's lecture. Dr. Florina Capistrano Baker received her uh, doctorate in philosophy, her master's in philosophy, and her master in arts from the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University in New York City. She received her AB in Humanities cum laude from the University of the Philippines. Besides the President's Fellowship at Columbia University, she has also received fellowships from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Asian Cultural Council, the Ford Foundation, the American Association of University Women, and Getty Research Institute. Dr. Capistrano Baker was formerly Museum Director at Ayala Museum, where she currently serves as a consultant. Her first book, entitled Art of Island Southeast Asia, the Fred and Rita Rickman Collection in the Metropolitan Museum of Art was published by the Metropolitan Museum and Yale University Press in 1994. Her recent publications include Philippine Ancestral Gold, published by Ayala Foundation and the National University of Singapore Press in 2011, and Philippine Gold, Treasures of Forgotten Kingdoms, published by Ayala Foundation and Asia Society New York in 2015. So without further ado, may I give everyone Dr. Nina Capistrano-Baker. Thank you um, again, Tenten, -ten, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'm so pleased to be with you. Uh, delighted to be back at my uh, UP beloved, my alma mater, my undergraduate alma mater, even if only virtually. And I'm so thrilled to see um, uh friends even though you're not on screen my talk is entitled leandro and cecilia loxin's gold collection at ayala museum and its implications for the study of philippine prehistory so the loxin gold collection was assembled between the 1960s and 1981 Le Leandro and um, Loxin is, as we all know, the National Artist for Architecture and former NCCA chair. And his wife, Cecilia, was a graduate, um, has a graduate degree in anthropology and archaeology from uh, the Ateneo de Manila University. Uh, she was involved in several early archaeological digs, including Pila, Lemery, Santa Ana, and the Calatagan excavations. Uh, the latter was fully funded by the late artist philanthropist Fernando Sobel de Ayala y Montojo and um, Alfonso Sobel de Ayala. Calatagan was first excavated by the Swedish archaeologist Olof Jans, a Harvard professor, um, and later by Robert Fox, who recovered two 15th century burials with a preliminary report indicating, including a sprinkling of gold that was published in 1959. And uh, Lindy and Cecilia Loxin and Fernando Sobel de Ayala also helped fund the National Museum's Tabon Cave excavations in Palawan, led by Robert Fox in the 1960s. Through the years from the 1960s onward, Lindy and Cecilia Loxin quietly assembled the gold collection, along with their better known collection of export pottery for burial goods, often contained gold objects in association with the trade wear. So the overarching concern back then was to save the gold objects from the looter's melting pot. In 2006, uh, the Loxin Gold Collection of 1,057 pieces was transferred to Ayala Museum, and I curated the permanent exhibition uh, entitled Gold of Ancestors, and you know, it will be there when the museum reopens. Um, so this permanent exhibition opened uh, to the public in 2008. In 2015, selected pieces traveled outside the country for the first time for an exhibition at the Asia Society Museum in New York City, which I co-curated with the Asia Society senior curator, Adriana Prozer. Um, the prominent Southeast Asian archaeologist, John Mixick, uh, whom we consulted early in the process of transferring the gold collection to Ayala Museum, evaluates it as, and I quote, perhaps the country's greatest tangible cultural asset and can stand comparison with any other assemblage of gold objects in the world. So um, this talk 
is organized in uh, five parts. I can. Uh, first, I'll, I'll show very briefly selected uh, examples of early gold finds. Then I'll discuss the history of the Loxane collection assembled between the 1960s and 1981. Then I will um, share with you the methodologies that I used in classifying 1059 gold objects that were transferred to Ayala Museum. Um, and the uh, fourth would be the interpretation of the material. And uh, lastly, I conclude with strategies for future research. I was listening to Bong Dison's talk actually, and I thought it was very interesting that when he gave a history of archaeology, uh, in the Philippines, a lot of the names were very familiar because they were also involved in the early excavations that I'm discussing here. So the earliest documented gold finds were those by the French naturalist Alfred Marge uh, from burials in Marinduque in 1881. And they're now at the Musée de Cabron Lee, formerly at the Musée de L'Homme. Um, these 19th century finds are similar to later finds in the 1960s and 1981. So note uh, on the left, the intriguing, uh, why does it go by itself? Anyway, I wanted to show you the mammary forms. Uh, seems to have its own mind. Okay, so if you look at the left, um, you see the intriguing penannular form or omega-shaped ornament with the four mammary forms. And these were taken out of the storage at the Musée Calibon Lee for, and exhibited for the first time uh, with similar penannulars from the Loxin collection in the 2015 uh, New York exhibition. Other iconic objects that uh, were um, uh, recovered outside an archaeological context include the Laguna Copper Plate inscription that you're all familiar with on the left, now in the National Museum, and the Agusan Gold image, now in the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. So the 10th century LCI was found near the Lumbang River in Laguna in uh, 1989, and while the Agusan image was found near the Wawa River, in Agusan del Sur in 1917. So these accidental recoveries must unfortunately be studied outside an archaeological context, not unlike many important pieces in the Loxin collection. As scholar collectors, uh, Lindy and Cecilia were instrumental in raising the profile of Asian trade pottery in Southeast Asia in the 1960s. They convened the Manila Trade Pottery Seminar in 1968, and uh, the list of participants kind of reads like an uh, international who's who, including Dr. John Pope, director of the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C., Lady uh, Percival David, James Watt, Michael Sullivan, Bo Gillensward, Tom and Barbara Harrison, Mary Tregear, and other scholarly luminaries representing the British Museum, the Royal Ontario Museum, Harvard's Fog Art Museum, Taiwan Palace Museum, Indonesia National Museum, Sarawak Museum, and others. So it was quite a big event and even today you have scholars who remember this uh, groundbreaking uh, seminar and representing the Philippine panel with Mr. and Mrs. Loxin were National Museum Director Robert Fox and Dr. Rosa Tenazas. The Loxin book, Oriental Trade Ceramics, discovered in the Philippines in, um, uh, published in 1968, provides a complete record of their excavations from the 11th, uh, of 11th to 14th century trade ceramics recovered under controlled conditions in Santa Ana in 1961. So on the right, you see some gold objects that they had at this time. Remember, this is still the 1960s and they still had 20 more years uh, to uh, assemble the, their collection to what it is today. So as coal continued to trickle into the market along with associated export ceramics, Mrs. Loxin was concerned that important archaeological data was being lost. So in 1981, she funded the Northeastern Mindanao Salvage Project led by American archaeologist Dr. Warren Peterson, whose team recovered six burials at the Masago site near present-day Butuan City. And associated ceramics, some of which you see here, 
uh, and radiocarbon dating of uh, charcoal samples indicated approximate dates between the 10th to the 12th centuries. Burial 3 that you see on the right um, here um, appeared to be a warrior's burial with an iron spear uh, piercing one of the eyes and gold clippings uh, indicate a uh, practice of cutting the gold sheets into the, into the shape of eye covers in C2, right at the time of burial. Shortly after uh, Peterson completed his excavations in Masago, a spectacular gold hoard nicknamed the Surigao Treasure trickled out of the nearby hamlet of Magroyong after a worker on an irrigation project accidentally uh, discovered glistening gold objects scattered among the soil sliced off the nearby mountaintop. As word spread, intensive looting destroyed valuable archaeological data. There has been um, a number of inaccurate um, stories about how Sur the Surigao cord was found. And to get the story straight, uh, my friend, uh, my family friend, journalist Checha Lazaro, actually my sister's best friend, uh, and I collaborated with Probe Team and Ayala Museum staff to find Berto. And some of you watching were on this trip trip with us. Uh, and Berto had changed his name and gone into hiding due to a kidnapping scare. So Checha's team successfully located Berto and the parish priest to whom he had entrusted the horde. And um, so there's a nine-part video documentary of uh, Berto Sega available online, Gintong Pamana by Checha Lazaro. I also summarized the events in my 2015 book. So according to Berto, the first object he noticed was a glistening helmet that looked like it could be gold. So he switched off his scraper to investigate. And um, then next he found a very long necklace that he uh, nicknamed Quintas Ninanay. From his description, this appears to be the kamagi that you see on top here in the BSP collection on top, which consists of 12 necklaces strung together into a nearly 15 uh, long chain of uh, 15 foot long chain of smooth interlocking beads. Um, I thought the best way to of uh, showing this spectacular chain. Uh, in the New York exhibit was for the exhibition designer to create a glass uh, display case that was accessible on both sides. So it was quite impressive. Uh, meanwhile, the gold helmet that you see below was actually uh, a bowl and it found its home to um, uh, the Loxin collection and eventually Ayala Museum. And this elegant bowl has had quite a journey from uh, being nearly crushed under Berta's scraper to finally seeing the light at the Ayala Museum's permanent collection and then traveling to New York City where you see it on the left being unpacked and weighed and I can see the uh, Ken Esguera's uh, hand there uh, covered with bangles uh, trying to uh, unpack that and also being installed in the Asian Society's galleries. Now, Mrs. Loxin um, deployed her academic training to meticulously document her collection with detailed sketches, measurements, weight, geographic provenance, goldsmithing methods, photographs, and other details. And I just want to show some examples uh, of her annotated sketches. This is a hinged ear ornament uh, decorated in repose that was found in association with gold, a gold cup, bangles, a large finger ring, and Camarines sur. This is a sketch of a cord weight recovered from Butuan in 1977, showing elevation, top, and cross section. Uh, she also has a detailed sketch of a gold waistband here with zigzag patterns of segmented tubular beads and granulated, a granulated buckle. Now, when the time came to share the staggering collection with the public, I worked closely with Mrs. Loxin in documenting the objects for transfer to Ayala Museum. The permanent exhibition opened in 2008 and the catalog was published by Ayala Foundation and the National University Press of Singapore, uh, which handled the international peer review process. And uh, we have some um, really positive reviews from our international colleagues. Now, um, Mrs. Loxin helped me develop a provenance map for this book 
calling in the so-called king of pot hunters who allegedly retired from the business and was now willing to divulge the actual sites of recovery for our map um, because uh, they had obviously given wrong locations earlier to mislead the rival pot hunters. So this um, photograph was taken during the mapping meeting with a retired pot hunter. Um, on the right is the director of Luxing Foundation, uh, Suzanne Ledesma. Now, we published this map of irregular finds in the Butuan area in the 2011 book, and um, note that the Butuan culture area actually uh, associated with the gold finds here, they're mostly in the coastal areas and in the riverine areas, and they all transcend the political boundaries of the present-day provinces of Agusan del Norte, Agdal del Sur, and Surigao del Sur. Now, when we compared the distribution of gold mines in the archipelago on the right uh, with uh, the sites of gold recovery, uh, they correspond really to the regions rich with gold deposits. When the gold collection was transferred to Ayala Museum, um, my immediate task was to develop a framework for classifying and interpreting the 1,057 objects. And I grouped the material according to four overlapping uh, categories of form, function, technology, and provenance. So it's important to um, develop a provenance map see here showing the geographic distribution and relative concentrations of the finds. Irregular recoveries, as you can see, span the whole length of the archipelago with the largest corpus um, in eastern Visayas and in the Butuan area. So my distribution of diverse types of penannulars are these are the omega-shaped forms uh, used as samples from Marinduque, Mindoro, and Mindanao. In contrast, uh, golden waistbands uh, with granulated repousse buckles occur only in the Butuan area in uh, Mindanao. Ear ornaments uh, with distinctive spangles called Kayong Kayong are limited to the central Visayan islands. And I think this is so interesting because, you know, they're, they're more flamboyant uh, because the, the spangles the, don't occur in finds from other regions except, uh, or to date, uh, except in Mindanao. So the cord weights that you see here are among the most widely distributed, occurring throughout the archipelago and beyond. Their diversity suggests multiple workshops, uh, possibly supplying different markets uh, in within Southeast Asia. Itinerant goldsmiths might have played a role in its widespread distribution, and it's recorded, for example, that the people of Bicol region in southeastern Luzon were goldsmiths. They were also traders and warriors who traded by land and sea, and their goldsmiths traveled from place to place. So similar objects have been recovered from Borneo and Java, as you see here on the right. And these objects at first really perplexed scholars in the past and were uh, erroneously thought to be ear ornaments or hair ornaments. But when we look at the Boxer Codex, uh, on the right, it clearly depicts the gold ornaments as weights for, or decorative finials for waist cords. Now, many objects relate to Hindu and Buddhist traditions, such as the Garuda, the mythical mount of uh, the Hindu god Vishnu. And Garuda ornaments recovered from e Eastern Visayas are again embellished with the distinctive spangles on the left, while those from Butuan in the center closely resemble the Javanese versions that you see on the right. Another um, taxonomic classification I used was according to function. So there are assorted head ornaments, ear ornaments, Uh, they're worn in various ways. Also, I saw this, I thought they were 
bangle bracelets and I thought, my gosh, they're so heavy, but you know, they were really for their legs, ceremonial cast cord or upavita. Uh, uh, which weighs only the Upmore by the bone class. So it is significant that this one object alone mines. So they might have been importing gold from the Philippines centuries before Spanish colonization. The composition of metal alloys and goldsmithing techniques are often site and time specific and might therefore provide valuable clues to um, geographic provenance and dating. So I tried grouping the objects according to the goldsmithing techniques such as open work uh, that you see here. Also plating like banig. Uh, also uh, granulation and filigree. And the so-called gear beads were made by fusing individual granules to form beads that interlock perfectly and strung together by loop-in-loop -loop chains, you see here. So the 16th century Spanish accounts indicate that gold chains were among the most valued forms of wealth with a number and quality of neck chains signifying one's status. Loop-in-loop -loop chains of different lengths and thicknesses have a distinctive um, square profile, as you see here. A complex loop-in-loop -loop technique was used to manufacture the stunning gold belts from Butuan. Um, we have a few in our collection, and so does the Central Bank. Uh, the woven sash with segmented gold beads and alternating bands of loop-in-loop -loop ribbons is fastened by gold buckles adorned with um, fine granulation. When I was a scholar in residence at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles in 2013, I collaborated with conservation specialist uh, scientist Alexa Gamardella at the Getty Conservation Institute to identify elemental composition of gold beads and to gain insight in the construction methods. So using X-ray fluorescence or XRF spectrometry, um, Alexa examined some gold beads from the x uh, loxine corpus. Um, spectrometry of a, 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 sorry, spectroscopy of a small diamond-shaped bead uh, revealed not only the high gold content with traces of silver and copper, uh, you see here, this is, this is the gold, um, but also showed that the bead was not cast but hammered uh, here uh, into a strip that was then folded uh, into a diamond shape, sort of like origami. Um, I'm looking at this because recent research on ancient Javanese gold using archaeometallurgy indicates that the usual solder of low melting lead or tin was not used in the early gold of Indonesia. So I wanted to compare this information with the Philippine material. Spot scanning where the granule was fused to the base sheet, see here, um, revealed the absence of solder. So note that the highest gold content occurs where the granule is fused to the bead. You see the green line here? This is the highest gold content right here where the uh, granule meets the base metal. So there was no solder at all. So it's very similar to the Indonesian uh, method. So you see archaeo uh, metallurgy has great potential to compare the Philippine material with a larger database from other uh, geographic areas. Now, um, anthropomorphic uh, figures uh, survive largely in Butuan. Um, I think most of the gold in the uh, more heavily Christianized areas must have been as heavily uh, converted in all places, and so we have these rare instances. Arms wears an elaborate headdress and this and a tree of life uh, motif. Um, her the florets adorn her diadem and her ears are distended, signifying 
high rank. And you see the details uh, from the sketch by Mrs. Loxin showing her upraised hands, holding flags or implements, um, possibly a ritual gesture or an identifying attribute. She also wears jewelry similar to those found in the area. This gold vessel is in the shape of a kinari. Uh, in Indian mythology, a composite celestial female uh, with, human, with a human head and torso and legs and wings of a bird. She's associated with music and personifies the feminine ideals of beauty and grace and accomplishment. So its uh, function though is unclear. And while I was studying the Javanese collections at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, I encountered a similar vessel from Java. Uh, you see that on the right. It's slightly larger than the gold kinari. It's made of bronze, but um, it's about the same time period. So um, they, the coincidence was so striking. We uh, thought we would uh, exhibit them side by side, and we were able to do this um, in the show in New York, where we put them side by side, they're almost the same size, um, and we, uh, it was quite thrilling. Um, one is an oil lamp, and we're not sure what the gold uh, uh, vessel uh, was used for, but probably for, for some ritual purpose to contain some sort of ritual liquid. So the recovery uh, in Butuan of a Kinari figure, along with Garuda and other Hindu-Buddhist related iconography that I noted earlier, is significant for it uh, stretches the boundaries uh, set by scholars in demarcating the spread of Hindu-Buddhist religions in Southeast Asia, which normally excludes the Philippines. The sophistication and transcultural references evident in the gold from Butuan suggest a long tradition of inter-regional exchanges with neighboring South and Southeast Asian cultures. So this is really significant because there's like this national amnesia that, oh, we were, uh, you know, atheist, uh, uh, animistic, and then we were Christianized and some were Islamized. Um, but this uh, substratum of this Hindu-Buddhist layer has uh, mostly been forgotten and we need to re-inscribe this in our um, consciousness and in our understanding of our prehistory before Spanish colonization. In uh, 2015, uh, Mrs. Loxin's vision of uh, traveling the gold to, quote, give the Filipinos abroad a face became reality uh, through the efforts and commitment of the Ayala Foundation's co-chair, Fernando Tsobel de Ayala, and with the enthusiastic support of the Philam community in New York City. So here's a view of the installation with, you see the provenance map uh, on display, and it was a wonderful um, installation. Um, and with great surprise and satisfaction, we actually gained rave reviews from the major newspapers, from the New York Times, calls it gorgeous, New Yorker uh, says it's fantastic. We had these wonderful reviews from the Wall Street Journal and um, you know, full, full page spread in the New York Times art review. And we also published a catalog with the exhibition, which also gained positive reviews. So um, uh, future research, strategies for future research. To move the goal uh, research forward, my current investigation focuses on these two intriguing objects in the collection. A similar object on the left uh, in the BSP collection, as this um, Loxin uh, piece on the left was published upside down by the late Ramon Villegas, who uh, mistook it for a pectoral, for a, a chest ornament. But as Mrs. Loxin correctly pointed out, um, it's actually a chariot shaped icon, uh, which I suspect must be related to specific Hindu concepts. I'm grateful to the Asian uh, Cultural Council for a grant to conduct field research in India to explore formal and conceptual links of these two objects uh, to specific Hindu deities, which I hope to do post-pandemic. Hopefully things will be normal at some point and we'll be able to travel again. Another more general research strategy um, that I'm thinking of might 
uh, be useful, uh, that might be useful is interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, at Columbia University, for example, uh, my department is called the Department of Art History and Archaeology. Art history majors are expected to take classes in anthropology and archaeology, as well as art history, because these di disciplines are related in many ways. It might be helpful for our new generation of archaeologists, and I find them so inspiring. I met many of you um, in Berlin at the USA conference. Um, it might be helpful uh, to consider incorporating art historical methodologies, such as formal analysis and seriation in their interpretation of materials found outside an archaeological context. And in terms of um, archaeology, during a roundtable discussion that I convened at Ayala Museum in 2011 with the archaeologist Warren Peterson and archaeologist art historian John Mixick, it was agreed that the best way to move Butuan research forward was for more controlled excavations near the looted sites in search of habitation sites. I mean, the archaeological digs do not have to yield spectacular objects, but the, uh, the goal is to understand uh, the, um, the uh, society and its daily life. And um, so searching for habitation sites rather than um, uh, burial sites might be a good way of doing this. So um, I do hope that uh, our young archaeologists will be interested and uh, will have the, um, will be in a good position with local and international funding from grant making bodies to embark on this exciting journey and have sufficient funding, um, which is always the problem, right? Um, so an inter to just to conclude, an interdisciplinary inquiry would greatly enhance our understanding of early Butuan and contemporaneous polities in Luzon and the Visayas and their relationship to Java and other neighboring cultures and their role in the maritime trade network linking the Philippine and Java Seas to the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea, to the Indian Ocean and beyond centuries before the celebrated galleons of Manila crisscrossed the Pacific. The Pacific. So uh, with that, uh, we're grateful to Ayala Museum for taking responsibility for this uh, national treasure. And um, I dedicate this talk to the memory of my mentor, Cecilia Loxin. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Capistrano Baker. Okay. My internet is uh, not working a bit, but uh, feel free to ask questions. We're open to questions from the crowd. I'm sure there's a lot of them, uh, but there are uh, there's a lot of chats already coming in, I think. And there's and it's interesting about the archaeological excavations in Butuan because I think the National Museum has has uh, has a local museum there, but they don't have any gold exhibits or they never. I don't think they reported any uh, information about gold. Am I correct? Uh, which National Museum? Sorry, I was distracted. Sorry. The National Museum, the Philippine National Museum. Of the Philippines, yes. I don't think because they oh, excavated yes, they have the, some, go, mm -hmm. the gold mask. Ah, right, they have right. The gold right. mask, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. from Otton. Okay. And there is a question from Miss Kate Lim, statically excavated in context. How were these materials authenticated? Um, that's a very complex, that's a very good question, but the answer is quite complex. There's not like a single answer. Um, 
there's also always a question of which pieces are authentic, which pieces are, um, you know, uh, questionable. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that go into it. In the case of the Loxin collection, um, you know, you kind of, uh, first of all, these collectors are, are very experienced and our, um, Mrs. Loxin is an archaeologist herself. And so um, the practical, I guess the practical answer is, you know, normally when there's a site that was discovered by the pot hunters, um, you'd, have, uh, you'd have them start trickling into the market. And then the dealers, if they were found in Butuan or Cebu, for example, they were, will eventually find their way to Manila. And so you'll have this uh, stream of, uh, it'll start with the pots, with the export pottery. Mm. And then about the same time, some of the gold will also come out. So uh, you know that the gold was probably found in association with the potteries because they were, they're coming out at the same time. So that's one way. Uh, another way is after you've seen hundreds and thousands of these pieces, like I, I don't pretend to have the experience of um, Mrs. Loxton because she's been, you know, exposed to this from since the 1960s. But um, when I was um, working closely with her and kind of, you know, she's shared a lot of her expertise and her memories and her thoughts. Um, I think one of the advantages of being uh, an art historian or not necessarily, I mean, some people really have a very good eye. Um, plus, if you have formal training, you have that, that good eye, you, you can remember what things look like. Um, that's called connoisseurship. Uh, you, you hone your visual memory. So you have that visual memory uh, and you see hundreds and hundreds and thousands of these objects. In the case of the Loxin collection, I was working closely with 1,057 objects, very closely, like intimately. So, so you kind of see what it looks like. Um, and as soon as you see something um, that is not, you know when something's not quite right. Um, so it comes with the experience as well. Again, in the case of Mrs. Loxin, um, she shared with me that, you know, through the years she's been editing, you know, her, her collection because like after several years, she look at them all together and wait, something doesn't quite look right. Um, so it, it's that as well. Um, and of course the best, you know, the best, uh, uh, gauge of authenticity is really if you find it in situ. Um, but that's very rare because, uh, you know, I think in the previous talks also with uh, doc Dr. Joe Burr's uh, talk as well with uh, Yamashita Treasure and all of that, the pot hunters have more sophisticated um, equipment and they beat the archaeologists. They also have more funding. And so, you know, normally what they do is um, they look for the valuable things, they take them out and then they say, oh, by the way, hello, National Museum or hello, um, you know, Mr. Dr. Archaeologist, there's a site over there you might want to excavate, but they've already kind of, you know, disturbed the site, but, you know, sometimes they must still have a conscience and, you know, like, like the, the Balangais were actually uh, uh, excavated that way. It was the pot hunters who alerted the National Museum because they couldn't sell the boats. Um, so there was nothing in it for them. So they, so they, they, they tell the archaeologists. Um, in the case of um, some uh, the excavations sure. that were sponsored by go. the Loxins, yeah, yeah um, well, um, like Santa Ana was controlled excavation, um, the Masago, you know, the Northeast Mindanao was controlled. And that's also interesting because precisely what she wanted to do, what Mrs. Loxin wanted to do was to understand where these gold things were coming from because they kept trickling out. And especially in 1981, um, you know, they were trickling into the market and she knew that the archaeological um, data was being lost. And so she sponsored her own, you know, um, um, uh, archaeological dig with uh, headed by Warren Peterson and they did find these gold uh, objects that are very similar to the ones coming uh, into the market so that's another you know that's another way of gauging mm -hmm. whether something's authentic um, if you remember the um, the burial three with the um, with a warrior um, you'll see he had a kamagi necklace, the gear bead, uh, the interlocking beads. That's very similar 
uh, to some of the ones that were looted with no archaeological context. But this one we know um, from the radiocarbon dating and the uh, associated pottery there from the, uh, according to Peterson, they're probably uh, 10th to 12th century. So that also coincides with a lot of the gold coming out as Surigao treasure, which is um, dated to approximately, and this is approximate, okay, so it's approximately 10th to 13th centuries because that's based on the associated um, ceramics that were coming out at the same time that the gold was coming out. So you have the Yue and um, all these, uh, you know, dateable uh, export ceramics. So it's all relative. Uh, so this is what was, uh, okay. And this is what was the technique used for the Surigao excavation, uh, the Surigao materials, I meant, sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We made it very clear in the book. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only archaeological right. controlled excavation are the ones from the Masago site. Those are also at National Museum on long-term yeah. loan um, from the Loxin uh, Foundation. But uh, the so-called Surigao treasure that's at the Central Bank and at the National uh, at the sorry at the Ayala Museum because they're, they're really twin uh, collections because when they were coming out in 1981 the dilemma was are we going to buy this or are we going to just let it let them melt it because the pot hunters were chopping these pieces um, we've been re able to reconstruct for example we have a belt uh, that Mrs. Oxin bought, and then later we found the buckle that was sold by another uh, dealer. And then um, I don't know if I should feel back. So they were chopping it up, and you know, the, the Kinari, it's this beautiful Kinari, but you'll see the wings have been chopped off and the tail have been has been chopped off. So um so it was for the really spectacular pieces they would go to the central bank which had a lot of funding and uh to the locks in to mrs locks in they knew she was interested so the best pieces ended up with central bank and with the locks in collection and that dilemma that you know, Dr. Laya has said in a published uh, uh, videotaped interviews, it's the same dilemma that Mrs. Loxin had. What do you do? It's there. If you don't buy it and save it and preserve it, it's going to be melted. So, you know, the, 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 the I guess the motivation was always to save it from the melting pot right. so that it will survive and it can be shared with the nation. The, uh, there was never this idea of hoarding for oneself. The idea was always, we have to save it, and at some point, we're going to put this in a museum, and we're going to share it with everyone. So, mm -hmm. you know. All right, thank you. Um, that's, I guess there's other e expansions of that question, but there are other questions. Um, Juber, Juber uh, is, the, is the practice of gold metallurgy in the Philippines in early times same as that of Indonesia where the latter used copper and gold instead of tin and lead? So has, yes. has there been any? Well, I'm not, okay. I'm silver, not sorry, an silver, expert. Sorry. I'm not an expert on Indonesian um, gold. That's uh, that's Dr. John Mixick and some other colleagues. Um, although I, you know, I, I keep abreast of what's happening with the Indonesian material, especially the Javanese material, because formally related to the Philippine material, and I think there was a lot of uh, trading and interaction going on there. But um, there was recently a conference on gold and archaeometallurgy at Yale a few years ago, and then there's all, there was also a big study uh, at the Chopin Museum with Pinky Cow, where they had um, metal experts, archaeometallurgists, actually investigate uh, and analyze the gold content and analyze the um, the, meth the methods, the techniques 
Um, so, um, for example, um, in the Agusan image, we had that tested um, when Ben Bronson was at the Field Museum. And um, it came out uh, with uh, gold, silver, and copper. And this seems to be a widespread uh, practice in Southeast Asia that gold would be alloyed with both silver and copper. So, because you know, gold, gold has yeah. to be alloyed for, yes. to, in, in order to cast it. Um, what's interesting with Indonesia is uh, when you, when they looked at the soldering, the, the uh, fusing the granules or the filigree um, filaments to the base metal, uh, there was no traditional solder. So the solder is usually tin or uh, some other uh, metal, but um, you know that was used later in other cultures, usually in Western cultures. But in in the Indonesian gold, uh, there's no such solder. It's uh, gold to gold. Um, and so when we look at the beads from the Loxin collection uh, at the Getty Research Institute, uh, we found the same thing. But you know, um, I don't want to be misleading. This was not a huge uh, project. It was just like a drop in the bucket. It was like we were just trying to see um, whether this had potential for a larger project. And uh, some people will tell you, well, gold is problematic because they don't know where it comes from. But according to the scientists at the Getty Conservation Institute, that's not really true. You can, they have now the technology to determine where the gold is from. But the catch is they need to have a big database. So, you know, they have to have a big <laughs> yeah. enough database worldwide to be able to you know, match the gold with uh, certain geographic areas. Okay, so that's where the XRF comes in. So, and, yes. Oh, all right. Yeah. And also, do they need the mining, the, the, the basic signature of where it was being mined, where the gold was being mined? No, we, we couldn't oh. do that. We couldn't do that. That's a much larger project. This was just a very okay. basic thing that right. we did. You could do it if you have the funding, you could mm -hmm. do it and you have people who are interested in doing that at the conservation mm -hmm. institute but um this was um something that you know we had no special funding this was all you know could you help me we're both here and you know while i'm here could you do this and you know that sort of thing and we'll see if you know there's something here for the future that we can use that we can apply for a grant and maybe you know have uh collaboration with Indonesia or um, and, and can see all the different technologies that the gold content and we can compare and see scientifically see if there are any connections or influences. Well we have one of the students who studied the gold uh, the method of baking gold uh is mm -hmm. here victor estrella so maybe all right oh hi we and, met yes uh, I, he doesn't have good connection so he just texts on the chat um and there are more questions at uh, tj dimakali commented that there apart from spectroscopy perhaps machine learning and data science could be used to find similarities and differences in construction. Although I suppose that it has to start somewhere. So it has, it can start through the, the art, the art studies method first, because that that's how they connect the designs as well, right? I, uh, I, I think it's more like a simultaneous, like I was, that's why mm -hmm. I was suggesting an interdisciplinary, method mm -hmm. because yes. I'm not I'm, I'm not a technical person you know I had to do this with a technical person at the Getty mm -hmm. conservation she yes. did the work yes. I just asked her to look into this and see like you know can we do this and because that's another way besides stylistic analysis because you know stylistic analysis is um, uh, subjective right mm -hmm. you could be yes. wrong you could be mis it could be misleading but if you have um 
you know, um, um, scientific evidence and scientific technology, um, then you combine the, the visual evidence with the technological evidence and you come up with a stronger, you know, with a stronger uh, result. And that is, I think, uh, what I uh, am emphasizing that, you know, uh, we tend to kind of divide the fields and uh, I don't know how it is in, in Manila, but, but um, uh, interdisciplinary collaborations and transdisciplinary collaborations are now a big, big thing uh, here yes. overseas mm -hmm. where you have, you know, you have art historians, you have archaeologists, you have, mm -hmm. you know, metallurgists, and we're all working on the same project because that's the only way you can get it done is to work together because you have your own specializations um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you you can put together more pieces of the puzzle to arrive at this more complete picture. Yes, yes. And actually that's uh, a lot of the projects in uh, many universities are also, in the Philippines are also getting into that. So that's a, looks like we're all... Also for grants. The right grant. For, um, for grants, GD Rohan, that is also... Uh, Ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's true. And we're also lucky mapping. because um, because this mm -hmm. there's a uh, this will probably come up later. But there is somebody who is doing a map of the uh, or doing landscape analysis for Migs Canila, one of his projects of the gold mm -hmm. trade in. Um, but I think he focuses on the north, right? Yeah. Yeah, he does focus on the north. Wonderful, yes. wonderful. If we could do something similar in the south, because, um, well, me personally, I'm focusing more on the Visayas in the south because that's where most of the gold material uh, surviving uh, exists. So it, it would be more productive, mm -hmm. um, you know, for this particular mm -hmm. material. So, you know, it would be great to do something like that. Um, also, uh, when I was yeah. at the GRI, and it's kind of nice because you have all these scholars from, with diff from different disciplines. They're not all art historians. They're from various different disciplines doing different parts of the world. And there was a, a scholar there who was really into uh, uh, GIS. Um, and so, you know, mapping. And she says that that would work really well, that method would work uh, really well uh, for the gold also, because if you can map where all the gold mines are, and then you map where all the recoveries are, um, then you come up with some sort of pattern. But this is something that not one person can do. I mean, this, this is a team effort, um, you know, that has to be done. That's true. All right, um, another question from GTE Rojas. Uh, what are the common issues in the preservation and conservation of gold collection? And can you share some of the challenges you encountered and how your team was able to handle them? Gold is really um, easy because it's, a, you know, it's an eternal metal. So it's not something like textiles, for example, that you're always afraid is going to fall apart or decay. Gold is forever. But that said, uh, the gold in the collection, some of them, they're pure gold. They're hammered. They're very thin. They're very fragile. So that's when the challenges occur. Some of those diadems, like from the funerary diadems, it's like they're falling apart. We have to put them on some sort of adhesive just to keep them together. Um, so that's kind of the more difficult part. Um, but for the sturdier pieces, uh, it's not as challenging as, you know, as I keep thinking of textiles. But it's not as though we can just, you know, throw it around, not at all. Um, but in terms of climate control, I mean, that's not a problem. Um, so it's relative compared to other artworks, uh, let's say compared to paintings, uh, 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 costumes, it's, it's not as difficult. But um, with the high content, with the high gold content, 
uh, we still need to be careful. And um, when we brought it to the uh, to to the um, um, Asia Society, for example, our uh, head conservator at the Ayala, I think, is here. Ken Esguera was very particular about weighing each object before packing. And then you saw the slide when we were unpacking and then weighing it again, just to make sure, you know, none of the gold pieces are, you know, chipped off. Not that anyone would chip off, a, you know, whatever. But, you know, just to make sure that, you know, it's, it's intact, that whatever weight the gold was, when we brought it there, we didn't, nobody tried to steal any piece there. Um, and it, it's all the same weight when it comes back. That's also very challenging as well. So everything is recorded. Um, yeah. uh, Elaine Austria uh, from, I forgot Elaine where, you, which university uh, you are from. Uh, what are your views regarding the, what are your views regarding the reliability of the late 16th century Boxer Codex as a point of reference for these artifacts, which are of earlier Provenance, hmm, something that archaeologists always uh, talk about. Yeah, that's also a very interesting question. So the Boxer Codex is 16th century, 1590. It's a early contact period. It's a you know a recording of what the local inhabitants looked like uh, upon early contact period. And uh, this is my personal opinion. Um, the gold, uh, our our official date is uh, 10th to 13th century. This is it's always circa 10th to 13th century, and this is based on the uh, associated ceramics. But we deliberately put circa 10th to 13th century because we know that could change because there's not enough work that's been done. We need more excavations in the, in the sites. You know, this, the dating is purely relative. So when it's a relative dating, you can't, um, you know, inscribe it in stone. So it's, I, personally think that it wouldn't be unlikely, it wouldn't be impossible to have this Surigao treasure, for example. Um, it could have been later. I mean, it could have been uh, uh, created in the 10th century. But you know, Pigafetta's account describes these gold objects. Pigafetta, that was 16th century also. And he's describing the gold objects, similar to what we see. Uh, in the Surigao treasure and in the Luxin collection. So clearly these gold objects were still being used in the 16th century. Now whether they were still being made in the 16th century is something we don't know. Maybe in the future with more scientific analysis we'll be able to date the gold uh, if that's at all possible. But we know from the published accounts that the Spaniards saw these gold ornaments. They described them. Alcina describes all the, you know, the earrings, uh, the multiple, the panica, uh, the, you know, the larger ones, the kayong kayo. He describes them. And so it's not unusual, it's not surprising that similar objects are depicted in the, in the Boxer Codex because this is precisely the period that the Spaniards first were encountering the, uh, the local populations and they were still wearing these gold ornaments. So there's, I see no discrepancy there at all. And, and in fact, the Boxer Codex has a lot of good information about, and still being used by both historians and oh, archaeologists. Yes even up to now, uh, not just in analyzing the gold or other materials, we're also using that in understanding or trying to push back uh, beliefs or uh, ideas, practices, and see, because there's, uh, what we're trying to see as archaeologists as well is a continuity, right? So mm. I guess that's something that the Boxer Codex allows. It's a good thing that the Boxer Codex has all those information so we can see how the 16th century and a little earlier maybe a little later because we have more historical records are all connected so we can start to push back 
all the information that we have based on the earliest material or earliest um, uh, records that we do have. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that's it. And, and be careful um, because there are several translations of the Boxer Codex. And I would really recommend if you're seriously looking at the Boxer Codex to get the copy that is by um, George Souza, the translation by George Souza and Terrell. Uh, uh, when did that come out? Um, recently, Two like minutes. last yes. year. Yes. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. two years because there a are few years ago yeah mm -hmm. there are many and it's expensive it's like two hundred dollars but um it has uh corrections of mistranslations from the previous translations uh and it's the most reliable version yes yeah um I think it's available online so or you can buy it online on amazon.com oh yeah yeah advertising I think so, I think so. And it's interesting because they describe the Manila inhabitants as uh, Hindu, not mm -hmm. Islam, yes. not Islamic, the Hindu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good. Uh, a lot of people can actually use that for uh, for studying because archaeology. Remember, we're not because there's a lot of new students here as well. So archaeology, although we're looking at materials. Uh, the, the question is always about the people who are using these materials. So we can use these um, information from the Boxer Codex uh, to get more, to, 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 try to enhance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To interpret. Or, I, I, to I, interpret, yes. Yeah, I'm thinking of, you know, how Margarita Sembrado, Sembrano, when mm -hmm. uh, well, when yes. you're excavating Butuan with uh, was it Willy Ronquillo leading the excavations and Margarita was part of the team. Um, in her book, she uses a lot of ethnoarchaeology. You know, she has mm -hmm. to study, you have to study the ethnology, the current ethnology to gain insights into what you're seeing archaeologically. Yes. Um, so th that's why I mentioned earlier um, in my department, we're not the art history department, we're the art history and archaeology department. And we need to, we're required to take classes in anthropology. We need to understand anthropology and archaeology uh, because that's, that's all part of this whole thing, especially if you're studying um, early cultures and uh, non-Western cultures. You really need to look at all of those different disciplines as well. That's true. Um, Jack has a question. So one of the slides showed an artifact from Okeo. From what date is that? Because if there was a Philippines and Okeo, I, I could be pronouncing this wrong, eh? Okeo trade, it could, may have involved Champa and Butuan if it was in the late first oh, sure, millennium. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, no, I, did, I didn't show anything from Okeo. I just mentioned it. Uh, I didn't show okay. anything from Okeo. Yeah. But the Okeo material, uh was uh excavated by a french archaeologist named louis malere in the 1930s i believe and um they excavated about a thousand gold objects but they were really teeny like thin and as i said that one upavita that we have is three times the weight of that gold in okeo and the archaeologist of course made such a huge fuss about wow there's all this gold at Okeo and this is probably the the center of the Funan the first Southeast Asian kingdom but as John Mix says Okeo there there are no gold mines in Okeo and um you know when Okeo fell that's first to seventh centuries when Okeo declined Champa rose into prominence and Champa if you look at the Songshi um, the, the annals of the Song Dynasty, um, Champa and the, then Butuan were rivals. Butuan wanted, you know, sent mission, uh, missions to, uh, to the uh, uh, Chinese emperor asking for equal treatment with Champa because Butuan had to go through Champa to get to China. Champa was kind of on a higher level than Butuan and Butuan wanted to be on an equal level and have be entitled to the same, you know, symbols and flags and, and go straight to China instead of uh, having to deal with Champa. So there's that 
political aspect going on there. But clearly there are relationships with Champa. Uh, Okeo and Champa uh, had some sort of connection in the past with Butuan. It's just a matter of looking for this direct uh, evidence, I suppose. Yeah, I think and more archaeology, mm -hmm. yeah. More collaborations mm -hmm. with people who specialize in Okeo and, and Champa, you know, more international collaborations. Has there been, uh, and on that note, has there been a comparison between Southeast Asian gold? Uh, yes, yes. There, the Yale conference a uh, couple of years ah, ago. Yeah. Philippine uh, material that was discussed was, uh, you know, the northern Luzon material, uh, which is not as closely related to the Javanese material. Because see, mm -hmm. that conference was held um, to celebrate the Thompson collection that was uh, given to the Yale. And that uh, Hunter Thompson collection consists of Javanese material from, yes. uh, I think, 10th to 15th centuries to dating, which, which I think is similar to some of the gold we have, but those are very similar to the Butuan material. Mm -hmm. But we, there was no discussion of the Butuan material in that conference. It was the Northern Luzon, because I think the focus all was on the mapping of the gold mines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 